began looking at the cell and the cell organelles, if I'm not mistaken. Then today I'm supposed to come in and look at a very detailed look at of the cell membrane, its function, and the transport across the cell membrane. Okay, let me just share a few slides. Okay. okay, are we able to see what's on my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I believe we've already prayed. So we'll get straight into the cell membrane. So the picture you're seeing on the slide here on the introduction is um, more like a summary of sort of what we'll be looking at. So what you see there is the cell membrane, a, a portion of the cell membrane. So we have, let me just get the pointer. Uh, I can't find it. Okay. So we have this picture of the cell membrane, the glycolipid, oligosaccharides, integral proteins, so on and so forth. So this is just a general overview of the cell membrane. So in beginning, we know that a cell membrane is a bilayer phospholipid, which is made up of proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. That's a simple rough definition I can give of a cell membrane. So the cell membrane is made up of phospholipid. I think, yeah, it's made up of the phospholipid bilayer, it has proteins in it, it has lipids in it, it has carbohydrates, all these things will be covered as we take a detailed look into the cell membrane. Okay, so what is the cell membrane? On other people, on other literature, they tend to call it the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is the boundary that separates the living cell from its surrounding. So the organelles inside the cell, the nucleus, the nucleolus, the cytoplasm, everything is contained within the cell through the help of the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. So this is the outer covering of the cell, which keeps all the contents of the cell within the cell. Now, the cell membrane is not rigid in that it allows particles to move in and out of the cell because there are some substances which are required by the cell and therefore have to be transported into the cell. And there are those substances which might be needed outside the cell either for other functions or for excretion. And the result, as a result, they have to be transferred outside the cell. So the plasma membrane exhibits selective permeability which simply entails that it allows sub some substances to cross it more easily than others. So substances can cross, but the, the rate at which they cross the particular cell membrane differs from substance to substance. So that's the rough introduction I can give on the plasma membrane. And I hope I'm not moving too quickly. I hope we're all moving at the same pace. Yeah. So that's that about the plasma membrane. Now, <clears throat> the, the model of the plasma membrane that has been globally accepted now is the fluid mosaic model, which says that the cell membrane has fluid components and mosaic components. Now, uh, the most abundant lipid in the plasma membrane are the phospholipids. Now, these phospholipid structure of the entire uh, cell membrane. So you, you'll see in the next few slides how phospholipids are arranged in the plasma membrane. Now, let me quickly go to, okay. 
I'm sure you can see the slide here. Is there a clearer picture? Okay. I'll wait with this um, picture. I hope we're able to see the picture on the screen. Now, this picture simply shows a section of a portion of the cell membrane. Now, this cell membrane is mainly made up of phospholipids, which each has a, a phospholipid is simply a lipid with a phosphorus group, so to say. So these phospholipids are amphiphatic. Being amphiphatic simply entails that they exhibit both hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties. Hydrophilic water loving, they tend to be drawn by water, while as hydrophobic, uh, they tend to shun away from water. So the phospholipid has two parts of it. So now the phosphate component of the phospholipid is what makes it hydrophilic. Then the lipid component, you know that lip, lipids do not readily mix with water. That's, they are hydrophobic. As a result, the lipid component of the cell membrane is what makes it hydrophobic. So phospholipids in simpler terms are amphiphatic. It simply means they have hydrophilic and hydrophobic ends. Now, this is the arrangement of the cell membrane. So you have water on either sides of the cell membrane. Now, when you look at this diagram here, where I'm pointing, and I hope it's clear, where I'm pointing this diagram here, you find that the hydrophilic heads, which are the phosphate, tends to bend towards the water. Remember, the hydrophilic in that they're water loving. So they'll position themselves facing the water molecules on both ends. Then the lipid layers will face each other in the space which does not contain water because they're hydrophobic. So the cell membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. It means that there are two layers of phospholipids lined around the entire cell. This is the general structure of the cell membrane. Okay. This is equally just another diagram illustrating the phospholipid layer of the cell membrane with this phosphate component here and the lipid inside in the middle there, we have the lipid there and the phosphate on top. We have the phosphate hydrophilic, hence it will be facing towards where the water is and the phobic ends will face towards each other. That's the phospholipid bilayer. Now, the Phospholipids in the plasma membrane can move within the bilayer. So even as they are in the bilayer, it doesn't entail that they'll be just fixed at that particular point for their entire lifespan or so to say. So there is movement in the phospholipids, which the, the, we have the lateral movement, excuse me, the lateral movement as shown here, which happens 10 to the seven times per second. So lateral movement is always occurring. Then we have the flip-flop where these two, this one above and this one interchange positions, more like flipping of the cell membrane. And that happens only once per month. So you have to keep in mind that the phospholipid layer has the ability to move. It's not just fixed in one position, so to say. um remember that the the cells are found in water and water is normally moving it passes through blood vessels blood this blood that blood this blood that so an example of uh, a cell membrane i can give is that of the cell membrane of a red blood cell we know what a red blood cell is i'm sure by now we know what a red blood cell is which carries oxygenate which is found in oxygenated blood carries oxygen using hemoglobin so on and so forth that will be covered in, in the near future but my main focus here is on the cell membrane of that red blood cell now the red blood cell as it's flowing in blood remember there will be a point where it will have to pass through very narrow capillaries very narrow venues and it has to be able to move to prevent bursting that's why you find that the the cell membrane 
is able to move. So now, as temperature cools, the membranes tend to switch from a fluid state to a solid state. Now, the rate at which that happens solely depends on the type of lipids found in that particular cell membrane. So as temperatures increase, it's more fluid. When the temperature cools, it becomes more to a solid state. That's the nature of the cell membrane. This is an example. So uh, membrane fluidity is the ability of the cell membrane to move. As you can see in this first diagram to your left of your screen, you can see there's free movement between the lipid layer, the lipid component of the phospholipid. So membranes which are rich in unsaturated fatty acids are able to move more than those with saturated fatty acids as illustrated in the two diagrams. To your left is the unsaturated, and you can see there's, a num there's much more movement as compared to the saturated hydrocarbon tails on the right side of the screen. Okay, I hope I'm not too, maybe are there questions before we move any further? I hope I'm not moving too quickly. Are there any questions or we can proceed? Okay, I can see the no questions, so we progress. So now, um, in between, as seen in the diagram below, in between the lipid tails of the phospholipids, tends to be found in cholesterol. Now, now this cholesterol has an effect on the fluidity of the cell membrane. It's ability to move. So as the temperatures warm, the cholesterol restrains the movement of the phospholipids. As it cools, the cholesterol allows the fluidity. That's preventing the tight packing. So in simpler terms, when temperatures are warm, that's the effects of cholesterol on the cell membrane. So as temperatures warm, the cholesterol tends to restrict or restrain the movement of the phospholipids, then as temperatures cool, it maintains the fluidity by preventing the tight packing
proteins. So oftentimes the peripheral proteins act as uh, receptors when hormones come to the cell they often come to the peripheral proteins then the peripheral protein sends a signal into the cell then that signal ends up going to change DNA transcription protons proteins are made that leads to the formation of uh, changes in the body by making hormones enzymes and whatnot and changes occur in the body so integral protein or peripheral proteins sorry so tend to function as receptors then we have integral proteins. Now, as seen, integral proteins traverse the entire sectioning of the cell membrane. And these normally act as, as channels such that molecules are able to move from one side of the cell membrane to the other side of the cell membrane simply by passing through that particular protein. Those are two functions you can talk about when it comes to the peripheral proteins and the integral proteins. Now, we're going to talk about uh, six major functions of membrane proteins. So we've got six major functions, transport, enzymatic activity, signal transduction, cell-to-cell -cell recognition, intercellular joining, excuse me, attachment to the cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix. So I'll explain on each of the six functions using the diagrams on the next slide. So now looking at this diagram, let's look at diagram A, for example. This protein being shown here is an integral protein. And like I mentioned earlier, it enables for molecules to move from one end of the cell to the other as shown here of molecules, these blue molecules here, shown passing through, trans traversing from one side this looks like the extracellular matrix into the intracellular matrix through the membrane protein. These can equally act as enzymes. When they act on the substrate, they can speed up the chemical reaction and new products are formed. Then they can equally work as receptors for signal transduction, as I mentioned earlier. So a signaling molecule will come, for example, an example can give of the signaling molecule is a ligand for example, insulin. So that molecule will come and attach to that protein on the surface there. And that protein translates the sixth thing that that hormone cannot cross and enter into the cell to carry out its function why, why it has been released. Because, for example, when you have too much um, blood sugar in your body, insulin is released to help to lower those blood sugar levels in your body. Now, insulin is a signaling molecule, and that insulin cannot go into the cell to carry out the functions for it to begin lowering of the glucose levels in the body. As a result, that insulin will attach to the receptor, then that receptor transduces the signal and sends it into the cell then in the cell there'll be a secondary messenger be it ip3 an example of a secondary messenger which we'll cover in the, in the near lectures yeah so ip3 is an example of a secondary messenger that secondary messenger will send the signal to the nucleus protein transcription occurs translation proteins are made those proteins go and help in the functioning and the lowering of the blood sugar for example an example i can give and a signal transduction. The other function is cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So you can find that these molecules have these, these blue, <coughs> excuse me, these blue things here are, are glycoproteins. Now these are there for the cell to be able to recognize the other cell through those that enables it to be able to tell from one, differentiate one cell from the other. It can also be used as cellular joining, as seen here, these two proteins joining the two um, cell membranes together or plasma membranes together through that joining there. The other, pro the other function is to attach the cytoskeleton. Now, remember the cell, inside the cell, I hope you covered this the time you're looking at the cell. 
you have the cytoskeleton. Now that cytoskeleton is there to maintain the normal structure of the cell and prevent the cell from collapsing on itself. So the cytoskeleton keeps the protein in its rightful shape. So to prevent the cell membrane from drifting away to having funny, funny shapes, it attaches the cytoskeleton that helps in maintaining the shape of the cell and equally attaches the ECF to maintain the proper shape of the cell. So that these are some of the six functions of the proteins in the plasma membrane. Are there any questions this far before we go to proceed? <coughs> Sir, can you explain on the enzymatic activity? On the enzymatic activity. Okay. Um, on the enzymatic activity. So. We know enzymes are biochemical proteins which speed up chemical reactions. So there are some reactions which tend to take place on the surface of the cell membrane. Now, for those reactions to happen at a more faster rate, um, the proteins found there act as enzymes, hence they speed up the reactions by acting on substrates. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not no example is coming to mind but pretty much that's how the enzymatic activity really works on the plasma proteins they simply speed up the reactions happening on the cell surface all right thank you you're welcome any other question before we proceed okay so i'll take the silence that we can proceed. Now, the next component we'll be talking about uh, cell to cell recognition, which we spoke about as a cell of the, as a function of the plasma proteins. Now, um, we have carbohydrates on the cell. Remember, carbohydrates are part of the composition of the cell. Now, Cells recognize each other by binding to surface molecules. That's how they recognize one cell from another. That's how it says a body differentiate. Oh, no, this guy is a red blood cell. This is a white blood cell. This is a platelet. Oh. Let's not have cells, but that's just an example I can give. That's how cells differentiate one from the other through the carbohydrates that are found on the plasma membranes. So the membrane carbohydrates may be covalently bound to lipids, I mean glycolipids, or they may be bound to proteins which form the glycoproteins as seen in this diagram here. This glycoprotein is a protein and it's used for cell to cell recognition. That's how red blood cells are able to identify other red blood cells, white blood cells, white blood cells, and that's how cells recognize each other through these signaling molecules, which are the carbohydrates, which can either be glycolipids or glycoproteins. That's under cell to cell recognition, which we discussed earlier when we talked about the functions of the plasma membrane. Now we come to the permeability of the lipid bilayer. Remember, as we spoke, that the lipid bilayer does not just simply allow everything, anything to pass at any how at any time. So there's the way things are done. Now remember, the phospholipid has a phos phospho phosphate component and a lipid component, the phosphate being hydrophilic and the lipid being hydrophobic. So the hydrophobic nonpolar molecules, e.g. hydrocarbons, can dissolve through the lipid bilayer rapidly because remember it's made of lip lipids that so they can easily penetrate. for transport to occur, for molecules to move from one side of the cell membrane to the other side. 
So for lipids, uh, since the, the cell membrane has, is made of phospholipids, lipids just easily pass through like, like, like to like, so just easily pass through this phospholipid layer. But for those which cannot easily pass through, such as sugars and those other high, polar or hydrophilic substances, there are special routes in which they pass through. So there are three ways they can pass through either using channel proteins, aquaporins, or carrier proteins. So channel proteins, these have uh, simply hydrophilic channels that allow ions to pass through them like more like a tunnel. An example is this diagram on A above here. This is a channel protein. This is allowing ions to pass through. Another example are aquaporins. Aquaporins are simply channel proteins, except they facilitate the passage of water molecules. So aquaporins are simply a specialized channel protein for water molecules. And the other diagram here, B, that's a carrier protein of which, now carrier proteins transport, uh, normally change shape, shape as molecules are being passed through. An example is shown here. So, uh, in the first instance, the channel is opened upwards. So when a molecule goes in and binds to this component here in the channel protein, the channel protein reconfigures itself and opens in the inside, thus allowing the solute to pass through. So that's how uh, transport occurs through the cell membrane, either through channel proteins, aquaporins, carrier protein, or directly just through the cell membrane. That's been the case for lipids. That's the transport of the cell membrane. Uh, the other form of transport we can talk about is passive transport, which is simply diffusion. So diffusion is the movement of, of molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So if an example is here, we have molecules on the left side and we have plain water on the right side. And these are separated by a cell mem a selectively permeable membrane here. This just dotted line here. So molecules of dye will move from where they're more concentrated to the point where they're less concentrated. Well, that's the way diffusion works, really. So there'll be a net movement to, to the right side or the other side of water. Then now, this movement of molecules across the membrane will keep on moving back and forth, back and forth until there's an equal concentration on both the left and the right sides of the plasma membrane. That's that on diffusion. <coughs> diffusion occurs against a concentration gradient. A concentration gradient is just a gradient between two molecules, for example, most of substance A and substance B, the difference between solutes in those particular, that's the concentration gradient. So often they move down the concentration gradient, meaning from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. That's passive transport and no energy is required for this movement, the diffusion. Okay. Then the other movement we can talk about is osmosis. Now, osmosis is the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. Remember diffusion, molecules are moving, osmosis, this time it's the water moving. So in this case, water will diffuse across a membrane from a region of low solute concentration to a region of higher solute concentration. I think we have a diagram somewhere. Perfect. We have this diagram here. So we have these two tubes here separated by a selectively permeable membrane. We have water on both sides, but we have a difference in concentration of sugar. So to the left, we have a lower concentration. To the right, we have a higher concentration. So the net movement is that you see the water move from the left to the right as from the definition of osmosis, which is the movement of water from region of lower concentration of solute 
a region of higher concentration of solid that's under transport equally transport of cell membrane that's the movement of water from a region of low concentration to higher concentration of solute osmosis osmosis equally happens down a concentration gradient and it's passive hence there is no energy required for that movement to take place okay this is the same slide okay then now we can talk about the balance of water bet between walls of cells if, so we'll talk about tonicity so tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water that's a simple word of tonicity so when a solution is isotonic it simply means that <clears throat> that solution does not cause a net movement of water if a solution is hypertonic it entails that the solute concentration is greater inside the cell as a result water is lost when it's hypotonic it means solute concentration is less outside the cell so the cell will gain water isotonic no net movement hypertonic the cell loses water Hyperto hypotonic the cell will gain water. An example is these two experiments which can be seen here. One showing an animal cell and a plant cell. So in this experiment, you have three solutions. A hypotonic solution, isotonic solution, and hypertonic solution. So in experiment A, a red blood cell is placed in a hypotonic solution. In this case, there's a higher concentration of solute in the cell than outside, which entails that the water will move from outside into the cell as a result, the animal cell will burst. But in an isotonic solution, you find that there'll be no net, there'll be no net movement really because the solution inside the cell and outside the cell of solutes are the same. But when you come to a hypertonic solution, it simply entails that the solution outside the cell has a higher solute concentration as compared to the inside as a result movement to occur from the cell to the environment so when when it enters and bursts it says it's been lysed when nothing changes it's normal <clears throat> when it reduces size it's been shriveled that's for the animal cell the same concept applied in a plant cell the only difference is that a plant cell has a cell wall so it cannot burst or shrivel, but what only changes are the size of the cytoplasm. So in in no in hypotonic, it becomes turgid, it somehow bulges. Then isotonic solution is flaccid, no changes. In hypotonic, it's plasmalized, meaning water has been lost to the environment. That's that about tonicity, hypertonic, hypotonic, and hypotonic, and their relation to animal. And plant cells. Okay, hope I'm not too fast. I uh, already mentioned that. The other mode of transport is facilitated diffusion, which is aided by proteins. Remember, we already talked about this. This include the channel proteins, the aquaporins, and the ion channels. That's how facilitated diffusion occurs and equally this facilitated division is passive transport in that no energy is expended for that movement to occur and normally works along the concentration gradient from high concentration to a lower concentration no need for energy no need for it so the other mode of transport we can talk about now is active transport normally active transport occurs against the concentration gradient. So I mean, solutes will be moving from low concentration to high concentration. And for that to occur, normally energy has to be expended in the form of ATP. So that's how active transport occurs. So an example I can, which is given is this one here. We have this cell membrane here. Sorry, we have this cell membrane. We have this cell membrane here. 
cell membrane, phospholipids, lipids there, phosphate lipids. This is now the channel, channel protein. Now, when you look at this, we have the cytoplasm here and the ECF or the extracellular fluid above. Now, when you look at the concentration of sodium, sodium has a higher concentration in the ECF and has a lower concentration in the cytoplasm. But now we're trying to move sodium from the cell to the ECF. So what will happen is that the sodium molecules will bind to the channels here, these components on the channel. When that binding occurs, ATP is used. When ATP is used, a phosphate is, this uh, channel is phosphorylated. When your phosphorylation is simply adding of the phosphate group. So the channel will be phosphorylated, leading to its change in conformation here. Thus, the sodiums, the sodium ions, sorry, are channeled to where the highly concentration against the concentration gradient. The same occurs with potassium. But the potassiums will come and attach the, their component. ATP is expanded, change in configuration, and potassium is equally sent into the cell where it has a higher concentration. That's pretty much how active transport operates. Okay. This is just a summary, so to say, of the types of transport occurring on the cell membrane. So just a recap, we have diffusion. These are lipid molecules which just go against the concentra their concentration gradient from higher concentration to lower concentration. Then we have facilitated diffusion, which can occur through channel proteins. So these channel proteins are shown here, the first channel protein here, which molecules are going from higher concentration <clears throat> to lower concentration. The other side, this should be an aquaporine which is simply a channel protein except for water molecules. So the three above, the three here on the left are simply showing passive transport, no energy is expended. The other form is active transport. As you can see, we're transporting this to, to diamond, diamond-like things from where they're lowly concentrated to where they're highly concentration, concentrated as a result. ATP is required for that transport to occur. That's the summary of transport across the cell membrane. Okay. Okay. So now the last form of transport we can talk about is the bulk transport. Bulk transport is when you transport a number of small molecules into or outside the cell. Now this can occur through exocytosis. Exo simply means you are removing, when you are removing the cell components from the inside of the cell to the outside, then endo, you get it from the outside and bring it into the cell. So normally this happens through the lipid bilayer by transport proteins. So how this occurs is in this manner. Sorry, this is not in case I keep going back. So the other thing you have to keep in mind is that the bulk flow transport requires energy, which entails that ATP is expended. So the first example we can talk about here <coughs> is exocytosis. In exocytosis, there's a transport vesicle that migrates the, trans the membrane, freezes with it, and it's released. So exocytosis, we're removing what's inside the cell from the inside, we're taking it outside. So we have diagram one here. We have this vesicle. I'm sure you covered this when you're talking about the cell. A vesicle is just a, a membrane-bound organelle which transports substances. We have these substances inside. Now, this vesicle will come and bind with the cell membrane. Now, in binding with the cell membrane, the outer component of that vesicle will, will de degenerate, allowing this particular the cell membrane integrity is not compromised as it's a continuation with the vesicle itself as a result that's how exocytosis transfers molecules inside the cell to the outside in the vesicle the other oh what did it keep going back 
The other form is endocytosis, of which the cell is taking from the outside and bringing inside by forming vesicles from the plasma membrane. So there are three types of endocytosis. We have phagocytosis, also known as cellular eating, pinocytosis, also known as cellular drinking, or receptor-mediated endocytosis. This normally happens when it says, when, when the way you just see receptor-mediated, meaning something has to bind to that receptor to trigger the vesicle to be formed and the cell will be able to get what's outside and bring into the cell. The example I can give is this one. So we have a food particle. Now this first diagram is showing phagocytosis. We have a food particle there. So what happens is that there'll be an invagination. The cell membrane will form around that food molecule as seen here. The, mole the membrane is pointing towards trying to form a circle around this food molecule. Once that occurs, a vesicle is formed. And once the vesicle is formed, the food has been transported into the cell. So the process in forming that vesicle, we have this, this, called, this point called the pseudopodium. Pseudopodium is a component of the cell membrane trying to engulf or to encircle that food particle to be able to bring it into the cell. Same happens with pinocytosis molecules, the invagination, then the cell membrane pinches in some way and the vesicle is formed and that vesicle is transported to where those parts are required. And the last but not the least is the one below here, which is receptor-mediated endocytosis. So whenever I just share receptor-mediated, meaning there'll be receptors, these Ys are receptors on the surface of the cell membrane. So when a ligand comes, this ligand can be a hormone, a, a protein or something of that sort, to come and bind to that receptor. When binding occurs, that causes the 